the scandal that's rocking the car industry. The emissions cheating scandal continues to get even more toxic. This directly affects the air that people breathe. These events, and I fully agree on this, are deeply troubling. Volkswagen is one of the largest and the most trusted automotive brands in the entire world. Not only do they own the brand Volkswagen, but they also owned Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini, Bentley, and even Bugatti at one point. But despite their size, Volkswagen doesn't exactly have the best of reputations, especially in recent years. It seems that their ever-growing size has simply allowed for bureaucracy and politics to seep in. And when these attributes are present, it's usually just a matter of time until a company starts putting money over morals and ethics. This is exactly what happened in the mid-2010s when regulators discovered that Volkswagen was cheating emissions tests. And this wasn't some sort of isolated incident either. Volkswagen had been cheating on emissions tests for six years between 2009 and 2015. And their antics had affected half a million cars in the US and another 10.5 million cars outside the US. After this came to light, Volkswagen was immediately fined $14.7 billion, and this was just the first of several settlements, lawsuits, and criminal investigations. By the end of the saga, the emission scandal cost Volkswagen a total of 31.3 billion euros, or a little under $35 billion. Usually, companies have a history of getting away with relatively cheap fines, but this was clearly not one of those scenarios. Not to mention, the financial loss wasn't even their biggest concern. Nowadays, people are acutely aware of the importance of clean energy, minimizing pollution, and protecting the earth. In fact, millions of people around the world think that this is so important that they're willing to shell out substantially more money to buy an EV over a gasoline vehicle. So, with this type of history, there's no question that Volkswagen alienated a significant portion of the market. With these types of consequences, you would think that companies would think twice before engaging in such activities. But given the consistency of scandals amongst corporate giants, this is clearly not the case. So here's how Volkswagen got caught up in arguably the largest automotive scandal ever and stained the reputation permanently. While Volkswagen didn't make international headlines until the emission scandal, the company has very much had a history of scandals. But they weren't always the culprit. In fact, at one point, Volkswagen was actually on the other side of their fraud as a victim. Back in March of 1987, Volkswagen would announce that they had lost as much as $258 million due to fraudulent foreign exchange deals. As an international conglomerate, Volkswagen often deals with dozens of currencies, and it's their responsibility to proactively convert between these currencies and hedge their reserves to ensure that they don't lose money to fluctuations in currency value. In 1985, they had made one such routine hedge against the US dollar, but it turns out that the person selling them the hedge forged the documents. Fortunately for Volkswagen, the FBI would eventually arrest the suspect several months later. But unfortunately for everyone else, this was the last time that Volkswagen was on the victim side of a scandal. Volkswagen didn't just instantly jump to international schemes though. As with most things, Volkswagen's descent into the darkness was much more gradual and almost indiscernible. It started off with some misbehaving executives who were more interested in personal gain. Take Claus Wolkert, for example. Claus was the representative of Volkswagen's 300,000 workers since the early 1990s. From the very beginning, workers weren't exactly a fan of Claus. They felt that Claus was very much on the side of the leadership than the side of the laborers. But in reality, it turns out that the only team Claus was really on was his own. During his time at the top, Claus would abuse his power to pay out $3 million worth of illegal bonuses, which included $590,000 to a Brazilian lover. This earned Claus convictions on 48 counts of inciting fraud, along with two years and nine months in jail. But Claus was just one of many corrupt leaders at Volkswagen. Another corrupt leader was Peter Hartz. Unlike Claus though, Peter actually had ambitions beyond helping just himself. He of course did plenty of that too though. He was notorious for using company funds to pay for escorts and certain types of parties. But more than that, Peter had a history of trying to bribe people. He bribed Volkswagen suppliers to make it seem like he had won Volkswagen insanely lucrative deals. 
He also bribed the union to make it seem like he had more worker support than he really did. The only place all this led him though was facing 44 counts of breach of trust along with the two-year prison sentence. And these were just the most notable cases. Some other Volkswagen representatives would trick an Indian state into paying them a bunch of money for a factory that was never built. As you can see, Volkswagen was filled with these crony leaders by the late 2000s. But none of these guys were truly the dangerous ones. The truly dangerous ones don't care about winning money. They care about winning reputation. Regulators were by no means looking for an emission scandal when they started testing Volkswagen cars. They were actually just conducting a boring old study that was trying to identify the emissions differences between European cars and American cars. And to accomplish this, they hired five scientists from West Virginia University. As scientists, these five set out to eliminate as many variables as possible, except for the ones that were being studied. One of the variables that they eliminated was the emissions testing system. Instead of using systems provided by the manufacturer, they used a Japanese emission testing system for all of the vehicles, and this is when they noticed something alarming. Volkswagen cars weren't just emitting more pollution than they claimed, but they were emitting so much that they were breaking laws. Take the Volkswagen Jetta for example. According to previous tests, the Jetta was only outputting 0.022 grams of nitrogen oxide for every kilometer of driving. This was well below the EPA limit of 0.043 grams per kilometer. It was basically half the limit. But West Virginia found that the Jetta was actually emitting anywhere between 0.61 to 1.5 grams of nitrogen oxides for every kilometer of driving. Even their lowest reading was 14 times the allowable limit, while the highest reading was 34 times the allowable limit. And a very similar story could be seen with a bunch of other Volkswagen cars as well. When the researchers published their findings, the entire world was shocked, but they were more so puzzled. How was Volkswagen able to pass millions of emission tests for years if they had disgustingly high emissions? They couldn't just pay off a couple of testers or give them special vehicles because they weren't the only ones who were conducting exams. A substantial number of states in the US required that car owners get their vehicle emission certified on a regular basis. So this wasn't just a matter of faking tests a handful of times. This was a matter of consistently faking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of exams. So how did Volkswagen manage to pull this off for years? Well, it turns out that clever engineering can easily bypass exams conducted by poorly funded regulatory bodies. What Volkswagen had done was install special emission software onto 11 million cars around the world. This software was capable of detecting when routine emissions exams were being conducted and it would change a whole bunch of variables to reduce emissions. It changed things like fuel pressure, injection timing, exhaust gas recirculation, and the amount of urea sprayed into the exhaust. While this was extremely clever, all you really had to do to find the real emissions was use an external testing device that wouldn't set off Volkswagen systems. But somehow, regulatory bodies had failed to do this for six years. One of the biggest questions that you might have is why didn't Volkswagen just set their cars to always be in this mode? They were clearly able to pass emissions exams with flying colors using this software, so why not use it all the time? Well, the problem was that this would severely limit the power and speed of their vehicles. Their cars wouldn't be able to hit the promised 0-60 numbers or horsepower and torque numbers. If you're not into cars, this probably seems like a non-issue, but Volkswagen felt that reducing these numbers would go against their brand image and appeal. Here's the thing. The people buying German cars aren't looking for something economical or environmental. If they were, they would just buy a Japanese car. Rather, people buy German cars for three reasons. Luxury, social status, and raw power. This is why Audi owners are willing to deal with more expensive maintenance bills and lower reliability. If you substantially reduce the power of these vehicles, however, much fewer people would be willing to deal with the associated headaches and many of them would likely buy a Mercedes or BMW instead. With that being said though, it probably would have been a better idea for Volkswagen to just spend more time figuring out how to minimize emissions while maximizing power instead of faking exams, but that would be too logical. Anyway, Volkswagen would eventually admit installing the secret software and they would agree to buy back cars from owners at a pretty generous price. Owners not only received the pre-scandal trade-in value of their cars, 
but they also received five to ten thousand dollars in additional compensation. Volkswagen also agreed to spend $4.7 billion on programs looking to offset emissions and to boost clean vehicle projects. So financially speaking, the public actually came out pretty well. But the same cannot be said about pollution and health concerns. Volkswagen literally had over 10 million cars on the road for years, meeting up to 40 times the legal amount. And these limits aren't in place just for fun. Extremely intelligent scientists have determined that vehicles emitting more than a certain amount are more of a detriment to society than a benefit. And we're not just talking about climate change or melting polar caps, we're talking about lung cancer and lots of it. In the European Union for example, 20% of urban populations are subject to hazardous nitrogen dioxide concentrations. And 40% of all nitrogen oxide emissions in London come from diesel road traffic. Every year, 3,000 people die due to air pollution in London alone. So who knows how many people Volkswagen's high emissions truly affected and potentially even killed. The worst part about all of this is that Volkswagen wasn't the only one that was guilty of faking exams. After the news broke about Volkswagen, regulators started looking into all cars more closely and they quickly realized that a lot of cars had much better readings in exams than on the road. On the bright side, this has prompted regulators to tighten their testing procedures. But the real solution is of course EVs. And it looks like Volkswagen is working very hard to redeem themselves and earn back public trust. While Volkswagen had some doubts about pivoting to EVs in the early days, more recently, they've basically completely committed to the switch. More than half of all of Volkswagen's budget over the next five years is going towards EVs, which works out to $100 billion. They're pouring insane amounts into battery research, building new factories, and most importantly, scaling up production. They're hoping that by 2026, a quarter of all the vehicles they sell will be electric. And given that Volkswagen regularly sells 10 million cars per year, that works out to well above 2 million EVs. At this rate, some experts say that Volkswagen may even overtake Tesla in terms of EV deliveries, but we'll just have to wait and see. Do you think Volkswagen can redeem themselves by pushing forward the EV revolution? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you're glad that more companies are embracing EVs. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. Until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.